Orange Sunday. This picture is a couple years old, but most of us remember these Christians in Egypt were let out by the perverted, twisted reasoning of radical Islam. And they were slaughtered. They were put to death because in each case they refused to declaim Jesus. As a matter of fact, you can hear on the audio, each one of them calls out to Jesus right before he is killed. We wear orange <clears throat> as a symbol. Scripture is replete with symbols. We wear orange as an identity. We're identifying with our <coughs> brothers and sisters. We, we don't know what persecution is. Not, not like they have. We, we think things go wrong with our finances or somebody says something we don't like or a polit particular political group is in power that we disagree with. Something comes across the news that we just don't feel. We, we think that's tough. We have no clue what persecution is. Mm -hmm. If you have not yet, after uh, so many years of me talking about it, I would encourage you Go look, Voice of the Martyrs, Open Doors. Take a look at the stories that these people are telling about what real persecution is. Um, <clears throat> Why does God allow His church to be persecuted? I think there are a number of reasons that are presented in Scripture. But I think quite honestly... The main reason he allows his church to be persecuted is because that's oftentimes the only way his church grows. Every time great persecution has come upon the church, we have seen exponential growth in the area of persecution, dating all the way back to the birth of the church in the book of Acts, in the early Roman era under Nero and Diocletian. We see that the church is persecuted and, and they made sport and spectacle of the Christians, putting them in the arenas to be slaughtered. And yet at the same time, those people that are sitting in the stands that are cheering this are starting to, to get a little, what is this about? And, and the church grows. The church grows. The church in America is declining, diminishing. Every decade, we see more and more people leaving the church. We see less and less adding to it. And I think it's because we have not considered the cost. We, we have this idea of Christianity that is not biblical. Because we so associate and so identify our, our culture, our political ideology with our faith. We see them as intertwined, and, and quite honestly, in a lot of cases, they're diametrically opposed. You, you get into the Word of God, and you'll find that a lot of the things that we take for granted in America, uh, independence, the land of the independent, we're in Montana. This is like the capital of the independent spirit. And yet, God has called us to a state of dependency. <coughs> you cannot grow in your faith. Uh, that thing is bound to determine. Oh. <laughs> you cannot grow in your faith without being dependent first on our Father. You can't come to faith without being dependent first on the Son. You cannot grow into maturity without being dependent on the Holy Spirit. But it goes beyond that. And this is where things get touchy. Things get dicey, folks. Because He's also called us to be dependent on each other. Dependent, not independent. We're so concerned about people seeing that, guess what? We're human. 
I don't want people to know I mess up. I don't want people to know I struggle. And, and so we, we carefully apportion our lives and we take these things and we kind of tuck them to the side in church and around church folk. That's not what God has called us to. God has called us to be encouragers, exhorters, helps, ministers. Where one is lacking, another with abundance will help. Whether that be, you know, we like to think of that just in financial terms. But really, it's in every area of life. And, and it's give and receive. Not receive, 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 receive. See, see, we're all called to be enmeshed in the body of Christ. To be knitted in, to be woven together. Persecution. I, I read every week different things online. I, I listen to a number of podcasts uh, about people that have been in the persecuted church or are ministering to the persecuted church. And, and the stories are shocking. And we find some kind of weird titillation hearing these stories. They, they're, they're, they attract us. But, but I wonder if it's for the right reason. Because if they really were affecting us the way that they should, wouldn't we be motivated to help? To get involved in some way? Beyond just every once in a while I'll, I'll cast a prayer up to God. You know, there, there, there's something more. Scripture tells us that when one part of the body hurts, the entire body feels it. I can attest to that. I was doing some work some years back and I reached down to a piece of wood and I wasn't looking and I grabbed it and I lifted it up and I got a sliver right underneath my thumbnail. The thing was the size of Gibraltar. <laughs> and it wedged, I think it came out the back of my thumb. But it was deep under, you know what? My knee did not laugh in that moment. My elbow was not thrilled. My eyes were not streaming tears of joy. My mouth, totally bereft of its Christianity, uttered phrases that are inappropriate. Because my entire body reacted. <coughs> the first time I passed a kidney stone. Anybody here have a kidney stone? Ever, anybody here ever pass a kidney stone? You guys don't know what you're missing. <laughs> Christopher was little. No, well, no. Christopher was never little. <laughs> Christopher was littler. <clears throat> we had not yet had Donovan. And we were getting ready to go somewhere. And Christy was getting her stuff in the bedroom. And I bent over to pick up Christopher. And I started to stand up. And I went, Ugh! Well, that's odd. I put Christopher back down. And I said, Christy, I got a, oh my God! <laughs> because at first I thought, you know, I got a hitch in my back. And then... The devil was let loose in my body. And then I commenced with the dying cockroach dance. And now, if you have not had a kidney stone, you don't understand. But there is no position in the world that gives you any measure of comfort. So you try them all out, desperately seeking for one. And I was laying on the floor. Then I was on my knees. Then I rolled over on my back. Then I got into an attitude of prayer. Then I got into an attitude of anger. Then I paced around the room. Then I waved my arm. I tried to do everything. And there was no relief. <clears throat> I stopped counting at 42 stones. I figured there was just no point anymore. Now thank God... A small portion of that, a, a fraction of that, has actually been painful beyond a, oh, ah, I think I got a stone. And then I find out a couple days later I was right. But when they hurt, you just want it to stop. You don't care that your head feels fine. You don't care that your 
your, your knees or your thighs or your calves or your biceps. You don't care what great condition those may be in. None of that matters. Because the one area that hurts affects the whole. Conversely, one of the times I passed a kidney stone, I don't even remember what happened, but something funny happened. And it caught me, and I started giggling while I'm, I'm trying to pass the stone, and I, I'm hurting. There's something about laughter and joy that is also affecting the whole body. There's something about that. It says that when one part of the body feels joy, all of the body rejoices. When our children were born, I don't like childbirth. I, I told the doctors I don't want to see it until it's cleaned up and it's got a little hat and it looks like a human child. I don't want to cut things. I don't want to see things. You can take the mirror out. Only one doctor messed that up. And I told this lady time after time, I, 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 I really, unless you want two patients, don't. And, and Benjamin was born, and what did she do? She took him and she tossed him up on Christie's belly and looked at me and said, do you want to cut the cord? I said, no, I want to cut your throat. <laughs> Clean that thing up. I don't do well in those situations. I, I just, I, 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 don't get me wrong, I love the miracle of life. I think it's incredible the way that it happens. I think, historically, men were left out of the room for a reason. <laughs> We're not equipped. We're not properly equipped. But each time one of our children was born, there was this overwhelming feeling. I cried every, every time one of our children was born, and I, I don't know why. I wasn't sad. I, I, I wasn't angry. Well, I was angry at the one doctor. <laughs> but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't upset. There was just this overwhelming sense of Wow! Look at that thing. <laughs> and and you know, I probably could have passed the stone right there and never noticed. Because when one part of the body has joy, the entire body rejoices. So here's the dilemma that we have. I'm going to give us a little bit of a shift on our focus today. Because my hope is that you regularly pray for the persecuted church. Um, <clears throat> Voice of the Martyrs has a program where you can get a, a, a pastor in a persecuted country to pray for. Um, we have a, a pastor that we pray for. Um, and, and the thing is, you can't post his picture on Facebook. You can't use his name in any of the social media because these men would then become targets of their government or, or other forces. And so we have a, a pastor that we pray for. There's actually two pastors that we pray for. Uh, one through Voice of the Martyrs, one that we met when we were in Israel. Uh, his name is uh, Pastor Kuri. You might have, if you pay attention at all to what's going on in Israel, specifically Jerusalem, you probably heard about his church. When we were over in Israel, his church had been burned down 11 times. 11 times. <clears throat> and every time, they rebuild it. He's, he is building a church. He is reaching out to the Palestinians in Jerusalem. And he's not retreating. There are certain safer places that he could go. He could go to the Christian quarter in Jerusalem and, and have a safer ministry. But the people that he is called to reach don't live there. They live in the Arab quarter. And so he goes there and that's where he's building up the church that God has called him to build up. And, and it's an amazing thing because these people who at one time are so hostile and angry and, and disgusted with Christianity and Christians in particular 
when, when they see how his church responds to these persecutions, they start to ask why. And that's how his church is built. You know, people that are involved with burning down his church several times are, are going, what, what does it take to get rid of this guy? Why is he still here? What has he got? You know, if somebody burned down our mosque, we'd go rampaging and riding. If they burned it down again, 11 times, I'm thinking maybe it's time to go to a different place. But not these people. <clears throat> So I want to shift our view. I want to encourage you today first. Learn. Read. Equip yourself to understand what's going on in the world. The end times is not based America-centric. Okay? It, it really isn't. Uh, as a matter of fact, if we're mentioned at all in relation to the end times, it has a bad guy. It's not as a good guy. Okay? If, if we're mentioned at all. I, if honestly, the way I look at it, I think we're just a non-entity. I think something will happen between now and then that America will just become superfluous, irrelevant. But, as Christians, we are very significant. So I would encourage you today, be in prayer. Read. Find out what's going on. Lift up specific issues. You read throughout the Bible. A lot of the psalms are prayers. As a matter of fact, they pray the psalms today. A lot of them are very personal. They're very specific. I look at the prayers throughout the Hebrew Bible and into the New Testament, and, and people ask for very specific things. I think of Samuel's mother. Going to the, the tabernacle and asking God for a child. Asking and, and she was in such a state that Eli thought she was drunk. I've never seen that in this church, and I hope that if I ever do, it's because of the same reason. <laughs> She's not drunk. She's just travailing in this prayer. Very specific prayer. When Jesus prayed over the church before He went to the cross, He prayed first for Him, and then for His disciples, and then those who were afar off. That's us. And He prayed very specifically. Okay, so when you pray, pray specifically. But as uh, Pastor Yun, uh, he's a pastor in China, if you ever have the opportunity to read The Heavenly Man, I would encourage you to read it. Okay? Because being a Christian in China is not an easy thing. Being a pastor that is not a part of the uh, fourfold church, the, the four pillars church, the, the state sanctioned church, is very difficult. But he said something that really struck me when I was reading The Heavenly Man. He said, when people ask us how, we, how they should pray for us, I tell them, don't pray that the persecution would stop. Pray that we would be strengthened to endure. Because he sees and he understands that in the midst of persecution, their dependence is entirely on God. When, when there is no persecution, you kind of get into a, a, a state where you're not so dependent on God. Where, where life, you know, life is, is pretty good and, and God's kind of just an afterthought. You know, you really need God when you're in the boat and the storm is raging. The waves are threatening to tip over the boat. When you're sitting on a little floaty on the beach, you don't need Him so much. So He said, don't pray that the persecution would stop Pray that we would be strengthened. <clears throat> but I'm going to twist this, okay? Who do you see up there? Brothers in Christ. Absolutely. Who else? Persecutors. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> see all those guys in black? <clears throat> When Jesus came, when God set the plan in motion, back before the foundation of the earth was laid, God looked at eternity and He saw the need of man. He, he saw this. This didn't surprise God. It didn't sneak up on Him. 
He knew that man needed a way of salvation. He needed a way out. <clears throat> and so, he sent his son. Now, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Okay? What was the joy? It was the, the knowledge that what was needful to reconcile man to God was going to be done. He knew that was what was, was happening. And, and so he endured the cross. Who did he endure the cross for? Us. But who's us? Everybody. Yeah, I heard that, Ken. The orange and the black. You see, when, when this happened, I was mad. My first thought was, drop the bomb. Problem solved. Send in the Marines. Problem solved. No, because the problem isn't about those particular people, is it? The problem is about a people group that is so deceived by the enemy that they honestly, in their heart of hearts, believe that what they are doing is just. So when Jesus came, he didn't just come for those in orange. Or those in orange. He came for those in black. See, the healthy have no need of a doctor. <coughs> it's the sick who need a doctor. Now, I'm going to back up our story here for a little bit because you know the, the assumption is if you're sitting in church today, you're a believer. You have come to the cross. You have exchanged your filthy rags for robes of white. You have forsaken God has taken away your sin and replaced it with His righteousness. Okay? But how did we get here? Because see, at some point, each and every one of us came to the cross. But what were we before? We weren't so very different from then. Now, I'm not saying that before you came to the cross, you would have dressed yourself in black and beheaded someone. What I'm saying is that prior to the cross, you and I were enemies of God. Enemies. That's what Scripture tells us. That we were His enemy. And... and when we needed a way, He made a way. But, but, but prior to that point, we were His enemy. And, and we were deserving of His just punishment because we were His enemy. Okay? Now, prior to the cross, we were just like those in black. Before the eyes of God, we were just like Him. Folks, there's no good seat in hell. Okay? There's, there's no good place in hell to be. And prior to the cross, we would have gone to the same place that these men will go if they don't come to salvation. Now, my cultural upbringing, you know, we, we deal with a lot of pride in America. We really do. This first came to a very clear understanding in my mind. Watching the Olympics back in the 90s. <clears throat> I don't know if it had never been there before or I just happened to see it for the first time. But we were watching, it was the Summer Olympics. <clears throat> and I was watching track and field. <clears throat> And they were talking about, you know, the different runners that were lining up to run this race. And I looked, and it was very easy to tell the Americans, not because of the colors of their clothes, but because the Americans had blingage. <laughs> Nobody else out there running wore a gold anything until they won the race. 
But the Americans lining up on the thing, I saw one guy had a gold necklace on. It was a pretty heavy necklace. Probably why he lost. Uh, I saw another guy with, you know, gold rings on. And he didn't win either. And I, I looked at that and it jumped out at me. You know, it's kind of like when God kind of plucks you in the head to get your attention. I, I looked at it, I, I, I kind of just froze for a minute. And I was like, whoa. And I, I start looking down the line. It's like it was only the Americans. And as I started paying attention to the Olympics, I started seeing that kind of everywhere in the Olympics. We have a, an overabundance of pride in this country. What is pride? Scripture tells us that it is thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought. Okay? Well, what does that mean practically? Which of us has anything to present to God apart from the cross? Apart from His grace, what do we have to give God that's of any value? I mean, your very life is His. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Are you of the earth? Guess what? You're His. So, oh, I, 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 I'm giving my life. It's His already. Here, you know, it's like, um, I was going to pull my wallet out, but I can't reach it. <laughs> so, Ron, pretend I'm handing you my wallet. Well, first got to take my money out. I'm going to hand you my wallet. Okay? Now, Ron, wanting to impress me, gives me back my wallet. Didn't take the money. That's, that's kind of how we approach God sometimes. What do we have to offer Him that in any way would impress Him? That would make Him go, Oh! Wow! Nothing. <coughs> if you can really grasp that, hold on to it, that makes His grace so incredible. I, I, I'm just taken by God's grace. I, I love the story of His grace because I need it. I need it. I needed it yesterday when I got ticked at Christie and I smarted off. And I was not pleasant. And we were driving in the car and I, I, I knew God was saying... Even a fool is considered wise. If he can just shut up. <laughs> and I made it for about a mile and a half. And then I just had to say something. And the whole while I'm saying it, I, I can just feel God. Alright, take a breath, take a breath. Now apologize. Oh, shoot. It's so much better if I just kept my mouth shut. I don't have anything to offer him. So, in America, we're, we're so caught up with this idea that, that we're it. I believe America is a great country, even with the things that are happening today. By the way, side note, i got to take a moment, i got to address an issue. Charlottesville. That has no place in any believer's life. The blatant disregard for the inherent value of humanity is an abhorrent offense. It has no place in the body of Christ. And the men, women, whoever out there that are, are claiming to be Christians and acting like that, they don't understand what God is all about. And, and I say that to both sides that cannot contain themselves that cannot restrain themselves. Christians on either side, there's a better way for us to handle this, folks. It's called grace. Dealing with each other, speaking the truth in love. Not because you think you're right and you've got to make your point, but because you honestly love that person. That brings me right back to those men in black. I struggle. I really do. Because I see these atrocities <clears throat> done, committed by ISIS and, and Boko Haram and, and these other things. And, and I, I get...
My dad had a rule when we were young that you never started a fight. But if you got into a fight, you were the one that won. Okay? You, you did what was necessary to put the other guy down. And, you know, that's really tough when the guy you're fighting with is your sibling. <laughs> so, okay, Dad, which one of us loses? But as co-heirs with Jesus Christ, as followers, as believers, being the body of Christ, our hearts have got to be moved to grief. Not for our brothers up there. They're in a better place. Every one of them in the moment that he called out to Christ and his life ended was immediately in the presence of his Savior. Blink of an eye from this life to the next. Horrific as it was, they are receiving now their reward in full. So, so yeah, we, we are sorrowful, but we don't grieve for them as the world grieves because we know the end of the story. But those men in black, He came for them too. He went to the cross for them too. And as He is watching these these scenarios unfold. I don't believe that God rejoices in the suffering of His children. I, I don't believe that at all. I think He allows it for different reasons according to His purposes. But I can't help but see that God was weeping over those men in black. Because He gave up His Son to pay the price that they might be and so as you pray, you pray for the persecuted church. Pray all the more for their persecutors. Pray that as they're doing these awful things and they're separating families and they're enacting abuse and, and humiliation and, and terrible things, pray that in the midst of that, a question might germinate in them. What, what is going on with these guys? Man, if I was in their shoes... I would have recanted months ago. I, wouldn't, I would never have made it this long. What, what are they holding on to? Story after story after story is coming forth of the revival that is going on in the Muslim world. <clears throat> it's incredible. The things that are happening over there. We're seeing numbers come in that are just amazing. And I believe it's a, a direct result of things like this. Because a lot of people that grew up as cultural Muslims are looking at this going, wait a minute. Wait a minute. And I think the way they see the church responding and coming over and getting involved and helping people that are displaced, not just the Christians, because there are Muslims that are being displaced as well. And they're seeing the Christian church come in with relief. Tangible, physical relief. Also, spiritual answers. And the church is, is seeing these people come in. Now, beyond that, that's our job. That's the practical stuff that we can do. But the Spirit of God is moving. We're hearing story after story after story of Muslims being visited by a man proclaiming himself to be Jesus Christ in their dreams and in visions and calling them to Himself. We hear story after story. Uh, the insanity of God. I spoke about that a couple weeks ago. There was a Muslim man and, and his wife got sick and his children were sick and he went to the, the, the Muslim... I don't know what they... It wasn't a mom. It was a, a local religious leader in the Muslim church. And he asked him what they should do and, and this guy was not able to provide anything. And this, this man was in bed one night and he heard a voice as clear as I'm speaking to you now tell him, get up, go to this city. You need to go now. And you need to look for a specific place. And he received a picture of this place. So this man gets up, well, he's in a little village. He, he, he doesn't have a car. He doesn't have a donkey. He walks, he hikes in the middle of the night without telling anyone. 
And he goes. He goes over this mountain range. He comes down to the road. He comes to the, the city. He asks some men about this street that he's looking for. They tell him where it is. He walks back and forth along the street till he sees the house that matches his vision. He knocks on the door and guess who opens it up? A believer. A believer. And, and the guy opens the door and here's this Muslim man. And, and it's in a, in a country where it's not a really a good idea to let people know you're a Christian. And he opens the door and this man says, you know, I, I was directed to come to your house. And this guy says, yeah, why? And, and he says, well, I was told that you would have answers for me. Now this man who hiked over the mountains in the middle of the night for the first time in his life got to hear the gospel. And his life changed in an instant. And he took back a message of hope back to his village. Now, folks, I, I will never put a limit on what God can and can't do. God chooses to operate in ways that are far beyond my understanding. But when God starts appearing to numerous men in the middle of the night in a vision and proclaims, I am Jesus, and in me is life, and they wake up the next morning and they start talking about it and, and all of a sudden they all realize that they, they all had the same dream. And over the course of a matter of days, that entire village is saved. I know that my God loves them. His heart is for them. He doesn't like their sin. He in no way accepts or agrees with their sin. Don't get me wrong. And should they not accept Him, they will stand before Him one day and they will give an account. But He sent His Son to the cross even for them. See, we were His enemies too. And He brought us to the cross and He covered us in the blood of His Son. He took away our robes, our filthy righteousness. He gave us robes of white raiment. He dressed us up. He cleaned us off. He made us healthy instead of sick. And then He made us His own. And we can call Him Abba Father. He did the same for them. And our heart needs to be moved to grief. And we need to be in an attitude of desperate prayer. Not that they would just stop. Because if they laid down their knives today, they're still God's enemy. Our hearts need to be driven to pray for them, to intercede for them. To pray that God's Spirit would continue moving amongst them. Uh, there was a story on Voice of the Martyrs. This, this uh, ISIS extremist is getting ready to kill this Christian. And this Christian is on his knees and he says, I would like you to have my Bible. And the man goes, well, you give me your Bible. is isn't going to save him. I'm going to kill you anyway. And he says, yeah, I know. That's why I want you to have it. You will have need of it more than I will. And so this extremist, he, took, he shot the guy in the head and he took this Bible. Didn't think much about it until some days later, something kind of prompted him to, to kind of look into this Bible. And because they consider themselves to be people of the book, they consider us to be people of the book, but we're not completed because we don't accept Allah. And he starts reading this book, and, and, and the gospel is showing up, and, 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 and the Spirit is moving on this man. And he starts seeking out a pastor that he can ask about this. Well, everybody knows who he is. And he finds a pastor, and he comes in and says, I want to talk to you. And the pastor's like, oh, okay. Okay. And the pastor, you got it. I mean, if that were me, I would already be thinking about all the things I should have accomplished before today. <laughs> and the things that I did accomplish that had no value. And when the pastor spoke with him, his eyes were open, just like Saul. The scales fell from his eyes. And, and his life was changed in a moment, just like I. So I want to encourage you today. Look, research, find out what's going on. But don't stop there. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Pray for the strengthening of our brothers and sisters in Christ. But pray for their persecutors also. Because they desperately need Him. In the Old Testament, they talk about the great and terrible day of the Lord. Zephaniah talks about, about it. Zechariah talks about it. And, and we are, are, are praying for this day to come soon. But we need to understand that when it comes, when the, the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, it's not going to be a good thing for those that don't believe Him. It's going to be a horrible thing. It's going to be a gut-wrenching, terrifying thing. Because every knee will bow. 
and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, but they will do it unto anger and hatred and gnashing of teeth and an eternity separated from Him. And we will do it unto acknowledging the rightful place of our Lord and Savior and to an eternity in His presence. So I want to encourage you today. Remember the orange. Remember the orange. Remember these brothers and sisters that are suffering because they refuse to renounce our Savior. They refuse to deny Him. Pray for their strengthening. Pray for their encouragement. Pray for their deliverance. If it would be God's will that they might be delivered, that the families might be restored, pray for their strengthening, that they would endure. Pray for their persecutors. Lift them up before the throne. Let God change your heart so that you would have His heart as He views these that are lost. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, we bless You this morning. Father, the only way we can understand love is through the lens of You. If You had not loved us first, we could not love. And Father, you, you know the struggle that we have with our flesh, with our anger, with our, our... the injustice of it all. But Father, we know that Your heart, You desire that all would be saved. That none would be lost. That Father, Your heart cries for these men these men and women that, that are so lost, that are so deceived, that are so blinded. Father, we pray that Your Spirit would move amongst them, that the believers that they encounter would be as one body, speaking with one voice. And that, Father, that, that miraculous thing that happens when people begin to question and begin to seek, because You tell us in Your Word that if we seek, we will find. So Father, when they begin to seek, I ask that, they, that you would be found, that you would be right there in that moment. I pray for the church, Father. For those that are suffering, we ask that you would strengthen them. We pray for the reuniting of families. But Father, we pray that, that the testimony of their lives and their lips would go forth unimpeded. We pray for the rest of the body that is not suffering persecution, that we would be mindful, that we would have hearts for the whole body, that as one part hurts, the entire body would hurt. I ask, Lord God, that You would show us the tangible ways that we can be involved. Not just throwing money at a problem, but Father, being invested in And I ask, Father, for this body right here in this room, Father, that You would birth in us a hunger for You. That, Father, You would speak to us what You would have of us. That You would embolden us to carry these things out. That, Father, we would be so impassioned for You that we would consider all else a loss. Strengthen us in our weakness, Father. We pray these things in the name of Your Son, Jesus.